Hello, everyone, and welcome to this clinical trials update webinar uh, sponsored by the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. I'm Phil Yeski, the Science and Alliance Officer at UMDF, and today we're here to talk about a study to evaluate ASP0367 in participants with primary mitochondrial myopathy. That's the mountainside study. Uh, that study is being sponsored by Estellas Pharmaceuticals. And we're really pleased to be joined today by uh, Tolga Uz, who is the um, uh, medical director for Astellas. And I'll introduce him here in a second, but let's just uh, do a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started. I uh, just want to touch on a few things uh, to um, ensure that uh, the presentations fit on your screen. Please go to view options at the top of your screen and select side by side, and then you should see the slide presentation uh, fully. Um, a reminder that all participants will be muted automatically, um, uh, but please submit your questions through the Q&A box. This is really important. We're going to use the Q&A box for collecting questions, and we will have the chance for some discussion at the end. I'll pose your questions to Dr. Ooz, and um, you know, please don't use the chat function for that. The chat will be available. It will only be used by staff, but questions should go through the Q&A box. And finally, uh, closed captioning is available. It should have been activated automatically when you joined the meeting, um, but if you want to control that, either turn it on or turn it off, you'll see the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen at the far right, uh, and you can manually turn that on or off. Lastly, I just want to uh, take a second to remind everyone that our UMDF symposium, our 25th anniversary symposium, will be virtual this year. Um, but we're doing a lot of things uh, in, a, in a new way, and we're really excited about it. Uh, registrations are now open for this, uh, so please visit the link you see at the top of the screen, umdf.org slash symposium. You can also scan that QR code that's on your screen right now. Um, and the programming will be spread over May and June. The scientific sessions, uh, two Fridays in May, two Fridays in June. Um, then we'll have a clinician session uh, on Thursday, June 24th, and combine clinician, patients, industry, sort of all stakeholders participating on Friday and then patient sessions on Saturday. So we're going to continue to build out the uh, agenda for that. Uh, again, please go to the link above the slash symposium for updates on the agenda and uh, hope to see as many of you there as possible. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Ooz. Tolga uh, is a very experienced uh, drug developer. Uh, he's been working in the pharmaceutical industry for about 12 years and approximately the last four of those with Astellas. And uh, he will be telling us about their clinical trial, give you some background information on it. Again, submit your questions. You don't have to wait till the end. Please put them into the Q&A. Uh, we'll collect those up, and at the end of uh, Dr. Uza's presentation, we'll we'll do a little moderated discussion with them. So, Tolga, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and uh, thank you, thank you, Phil. And um, and first, I would like to thank uh, um, uh, Phil, you, and your colleagues at the uh, UMDF. Uh, it, you have been a great uh, resource for us, uh, all starting from the, our earlier conversations from the MitoBridge time, as well as uh, uh, um, the uh, UMDF FDA um, uh, workshop we had in September 2019 with the participations of uh, uh, some of your community members. And uh, uh, it, it has been uh, great uh, help and support for our study, connecting us to uh, your community and uh, support our um, activities and thank you again. Um, I would like to first, um, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, first, I would like to uh, uh, present briefly, give uh, um, some information about Astellas, our mission, and uh, our uh, program, which is about to uh, start. Actually, we are very excited 
uh, um, we will we are targeting to screen the first patients uh, uh, fully within uh, uh, this month. And, um, and, and then I will provide you some um, updates uh, about our study. Here is our disclaimer. And, and uh, this is our Northbrook offices and located in, 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 in Illinois, uh, in US. Um, as well as uh, uh, following the, uh, uh, the corporate vision of being on the forefront of healthcare change to turn innovative science into value for patients. Um, it's Astellas is a global pharmaceutical company, uh, uh, headquarters located in Tokyo with more than uh, 100 years of uh, drug development history and operates and, 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 and run the development activities uh, globally and, and in a number of therapeutic areas. Um, recently, Astellas um, uh, 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 follow the choose a focus area uh, approach in order to bring uh, emerging areas into the drug uh, uh, research and development into the pipeline and focusing on uh, 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 regenerative medicine like cellular and gene therapy, uh, the muscle diseases, mitochondria based, and, uh, um, and, and putting more uh, emphasis on uh, this new emerging areas. Here are some uh, numbers about uh, uh, Astellas, and, and as I mentioned, that uh, operating uh, globally uh, 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 with a large number of employees and, and, and uh, being in, in the, in the as a being medium-sized uh, company uh, operating globally. So, as a part of our uh, focus area uh, and approach. Um, Acelas has been uh, working closely with Mitobridge and acquired in 2018, bring, brought Mitobridge to Acelas family, and uh, um, in order and, and identified just uh, uh, right after identified mitochondria uh, research and development as one of the five uh, primary focus um, area. This uh, um, enabled us to came all the way to this point. Uh, as in this example, to, to support the development of diverse pipeline of preclinical programs and advancing them into uh, a global clinical development pro, uh, platform. So basically, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, using the, the, the resources of a, a, a big uh, pharma uh, uh, on uh, development, regulatory, and with the marketing capabilities, and in order to move um, forward the mitochondria research and development field. So this is uh, this has been Astellas' uh, uh, um, and, and, and commitment to the field. So I would like to talk uh, briefly about uh, our compound. That's why we are here today to provide you some updates. We have uh, presented uh, uh, again this uh, in in the past in. Uh, uh, like Phil was mentioning earlier in the previous uh, UMDF symposiums and the forums uh, uh, um, um, created by uh, um, UMDF. Um, um, our uh, uh, compound is a PPAR delta modulator. These are uh, a new um, class of uh, uh, specific PPAR uh, uh, targets, and it has been an outcome of uh, uh, long uh, um, research. And uh, um, we are targeting um, and fatigue and exercise intolerance in uh, patients with primary mitochondrial myopathies. So uh, briefly about uh, PPARS, peroxisome proliferator activated uh, receptors. Uh, these are a nuclear receptor family with uh, multiple uh, isoforms. Here our target is uh, a delta. These are uh, uh, these receptors act as, as transcription factors and control wide range of biological processes by regulating uh, gene expression and leading to uh, improvement in muscle health and function. What basically we are uh, uh, investigating whether um, uh, our compound ASP0367 um, can turn on the PPAR delta pathway and, and, and up to the potential uh, benefits on the muscle function 
and health. Basically, um, um, as I uh, mentioned in the previous slides, um, as uh, nuclear transcription factors, uh, they regulate when they are uh, turned on, they, they regulate the expression of number of uh, uh, genes within the cell and, uh, um, and, and leading uh, mitochondria using fatty acids and, and more often and, and generating more mitochondria in, in the cells and, and bringing this uh, um, fatty acids uh, and for ener energy production and uh, um, improving overall muscle function. So the, um, where we are at, uh, uh, at the clinic uh, with this R compound, we have uh, finished the uh, phase one, single and multiple ascending dose studies in healthy volunteers. And, uh, uh, and that uh, um, favorable uh, uh, profile of the compound led us to move the um, phase 1b and phase 2 three studies with our compound. Uh, we have two uh, uh, ongoing parallel uh, programs, activities uh, with this compound, targeting two myopathies in which mitochondrial functional deficits are either primarily or secondarily involved in disease pathology. First one is uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy study. It's a phase 1b study. Uh, we recently screened our uh, first patient and just started. And the second one is uh, today what we will talk more in detail is a uh, phase two, three study uh, 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 for primary mitochondrial myopathies. <laughs> so here are the, the, our disclosures about um, our compound and the study. So this is a um, phase two, three uh, a seamless uh, uh, design. It's a randomized double bl uh, blind placebo controlled uh, um, study. Uh, currently we are planning to enroll about 140 uh, uh, participants with primary mitochondrial myopathy. And the, our uh, primary objective is to, to evaluate, to assess the effect of our compound on functional improvement. Um, and, and as well as the safety of telorbit of our compound. We are, uh, um, this is a US um, only uh, study with about uh, uh, participation of uh, 15 sites across the states. And, um, and the information I will be sharing with you uh, in, in it's in clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, you you uh, see the, um, uh, the registration numbers and you can uh, uh, see more details about uh, our study at the uh, clinicaltrials.com. <clears throat> so um, just briefly to talk about the, uh, the, the uh, study design and schematic. And the following uh, uh, four week of uh, standard screening period, uh, eligible uh, participants will be randomized uh, um, one of the two dose levels of our compound along with the placebo. <clears throat> this is um, our first <clears throat> phase two uh, a portion of our study, which by using specific pharmacodynamic markers, we will uh, uh, um, uh, confirm the, the, the dose we have been uh, 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 thinking based on the, the, the earlier pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics data that will be beneficial for this uh, uh, population to test the efficacy of our compound. And uh, uh, the remaining of the, 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 the patients will be enrolled after the determining the, uh, the dose for the, 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 the continuation for the rest of the study. And the, the, the patients will continue to take up to 52 weeks, uh, one year of our compound. And uh, um, as I mentioned, the remainder of the uh, uh, participants will be um, enrolled directly into the phase three stage and all the patients either participating during the phase two or phase three will be treated uh, um, either with the determined uh, dose and they will be randomized either to determined dose or placebo and be, being on their um, uh, um, respected uh, uh, treatments for uh, one year. Um, at the end of this 52 weeks duration, all participants will be offered to uh, uh, take uh, 24 uh, uh, weeks 
um, our uh, compound, which is our open label extension phase. So the study uh, will have number of uh, uh, site visits as well as uh, in-home uh, assessments. Um, this was also uh, discussed and, and brought up our uh, um, and the community members during the UMDF FDA workshop in late uh, 2019. The, the challenges and difficulties, even this was before pandemic, of uh, um, challenges on committing the frequent trials and whether can we collect some of those assessments using digital tools in patients' home setting. So uh, um, uh, this feedback and were, were very um, helpful for us uh, in order to design our study. Of course, later on the, the, the merging of a, a pandemic uh, uh, even uh, um, potentially could create more challenges for this uh, uh, participants even to make to uh, our study. This is why we have uh, tried to design a balanced uh, study with uh, some uh, uh, um, study site visits and some uh, uh, home assessments um, in order to uh, accommodate and overcome some of these challenges. And at the site visits, what will happen, just the regular uh, um, observing of the participants' health, uh, with uh, some blood and urine tests as well as ECG and, uh, and also collecting some information about uh, uh, how do they feel and how do they think through some scales and quality of life surveys. Uh, and also uh, we will perform at the site, our primary endpoint to test whether our compound, uh, how it, uh, it affects the mo functional motor functional outcome in participants uh, uh, with uh, six minute, uh, mainly six minute walk test. At the home setting, we have, uh, um, uh, we were, as I mentioned, we will be using some digital tools, both video and audio, and, uh, uh, and, and, and collecting information from the, the patients in their home setting with a designated window uh, uh, of, of days, number of days uh, throughout the study. Uh, um, their uh, motor function, as well as uh, um, um, their feedback and, and, and their evaluation of uh, their symptoms will be uh, collected throughout the study. So uh, we have again a detailed uh, uh, inclusion exclusion criteria at the clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, you can also always discuss this with your um, uh, study physician as well as the participating sites. That uh, website has the all information uh, uh, um, about the participating site and investigators in US uh, for our study. And uh, um, you can always consult and collect more detailed information. But briefly, uh, uh, our target uh, age window is adult subjects, 18 to 80 years old. And, uh, and we require a, a diagnosis of primary mitochondrial myopathy uh, confirmed with uh, um, genetic testing, and uh, we look for um, uh, nuclear and mitochondrial DNA mutations, which are known to be associated to mitochondrial myopathies. Of course, we are looking for uh, uh, um, a symptomatic um, uh, the myopathy as a symptom for a, um, uh, as a main symptom for the primary mitochondrial myopathy uh, um, uh, diagnosis. And also, of course, since we will be measuring the um, motor function uh, as our primary um, uh, outcome measure for the study uh, um, through six minute walk test, uh, we require also uh, participants being able to uh, perform this test. And we have some specific criteria around this test and uh, you will be uh, uh, informed and you will have a uh, fortune to discuss this with the study investigators if you choose, choose to uh, participate in our study. And also we have certain uh, exclusion um, and, and criteria uh, so that uh, to, to, to help us to evaluate our primary and secondary uh, outcome measures uh, appropriately uh, uh, throughout the study. Again, this will be reviewed and, and communicated and uh, uh, with the study investigators so uh, your eligibility 
uh, for the study will be uh, confirmed through this criteria. So this is uh, uh, my last slide and we can uh, discuss and, and I'll be uh, as much as I can happy to answer uh, also questions about our study. Uh, um, as I mentioned throughout the presentation, there is more detailed information uh, uh, with the, uh, the clinical trials uh, registration number of 04641962 in uh, clinicaltrials.gov website. Um, you can also uh, um, uh, reach us through the information you see on the screen uh, and the, the, the email and through email or, or phone calls. Um, but uh, we will be uh, using, as uh, Phil mentioned, there's an upcoming symposium in a few months, uh, um, bringing more updates and news um, through uh, the, the platforms uh, UMDF is uh, providing us. And uh, um, we will be um, talking more about um, our study and the uh, progress. Uh, thank you again for all your uh, uh, feedback during the, the preparation of our uh, study. Uh, it has been extremely helpful and we will be continue to listening uh, uh, and your feedback, which we believe it's very crucial, um, especially for the rare diseases for uh, drug development. Thank you again, and I'll uh, stop here and uh, feel I um, uh, can give back to you the microphone. Very good. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tolga. That was, was really helpful. Um, you know, it's such an exciting time for our disease community uh, <coughs> to see more companies, uh, more sponsors interested in, in developing drugs for, for primary mitochondrial disease. Um, I think it's uh, also important to just emphasize that this is, of course, an investigative new drug. And I know you included yes. on your slides, but it's just really helpful to remind everyone um, yes. this is still a drug in development. It's not available um, yes. in any other way. Um, Estellas is uh, uh, leading uh, this uh, drug development uh, process, and the whole point of clinical trial is really now to prove out that there is uh, both a safe drug and an effective drug. Um, and so, Toga, maybe we could just kind of briefly talk about the design of the, uh, of the study. I don't think we need to have your slides up um, necessarily, but just... Um, Kind of reflecting back on the fact that this is a phase two slash three trial, um, and, and, and perhaps people are, are familiar with the drug development process and that it moves through phases that really transition yes. from determining safety to uh, dosing levels to eventually efficacy and, and, and these sorts of things. But phase two, three is a little bit different than, than some of the other trials. What, what are some of the advantages of running this as a combined phase two, three trial? Yes. So um, um, uh, as I mentioned that uh, the, the first portion of the study uh, was uh, designed to confirm the, the dose levels. So um, um, oftentimes in development, the, um, um, what the formulations uh, changes throughout the development uh, at the phase one stage with uh, healthy uh, volunteers uh, um, the, after the following the phase one, the formulation can change and we advance as the program advances towards the marketed uh, formulation of the compound. So uh, we had a, a, a thorough evaluation during the multiple ascending dose phase with the health volunteers, uh, meaning that what we do, uh, we correlate pharmacokinetics of the compound with the pharmacodynamic assessments could be a, a surrogate marker or biomarker right. and, and in order to give the, some information about the potential window uh, uh, of, the, of the dose level, uh, the compound may be ready to demonstrate the efficacy, the, to test the study the efficacy. Right. So uh, um, um, we um, uh, um, wanted to br bring that dose level into the further uh, development uh, but also we wanted to uh, and, and bring the, the marketed uh, to be marketed formulation. So basically we are confirming in the phase two instead of running two longer uh, studies and, and this with the discussions, our discussions with FDA, uh, um, 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 considering the, 
the the the, the urgent unmet needs and and uh, and this uh, within this uh, uh, rare disease indication that uh, um, providing an and an, an opportunities and resu results uh, faster to the community uh, um, uh, this uh, design has been uh, agreed upon in our uh, discussions to accelerate the, the development uh, timelines. Yes, you are right. We have uh, uh, stages that we go uh, one by one, phase one, and then two and three. Uh, uh, however, between each stage, as you can and appreciate evaluating the data, getting ready for the stage. So basically, uh, uh, this is combining and two and phase two and three portion uh, um, uh, is uh, kind of accelerating the, the program in the case if we reach and meet our uh, endpoints, we can uh, 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 we have a potential or opportunity to, to bring the, uh, the compound to the market uh, sooner. Yeah, this, this is, of course, the most exciting you know, aspect of it is by using this <clears throat> less traditional uh, design, there's the opportunity to potentially bring the drug to market sooner if it dememonstrates to be safe and, and efficacious, yes. of course. So um, uh, that's really good news, right, for, for the community. Instead of drawing out the timelines even longer in a more compressed way, uh, we can assess all of those things. And, and you know, and again, I, th I don't think it ever hurts to just reinforce for our audience, for our disease community, that at every step of the way, there's really close um, communication with the Food and Drug Administration, right, to assure that how the sponsor, in this case, Estellas, is intending to proceed is what's best for, for, for the patients. Uh, so it's not like there's a rubber stamp at the beginning saying, yeah, go ahead, start your clinical trial. We'll talk to you at the end. There's frequent communication throughout that. And, and sometimes studies are changed, right, based on the feedback that you might receive uh, from the FDA. Yes, and uh, um, um, with the emerging uh, data and, and based on uh, what is uh, observed also at the advancements in the, in the field, and uh, definitely uh, uh, rare disease indications uh, I think uh, that is also personal. I think it is the uh, right way to do to uh, uh, find uh, um, opportunities to accelerate the timelines, and uh, uh, and 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 of course, that uh, doesn't mean that uh, as as you mentioned, we will do every step with the close uh, communication with uh, the FDA and the safety and tolerability part uh, is extremely uh, important. Uh, we collect this information continuously, and uh, uh, we have uh, implemented all, also in this study in independent uh, 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 safety data, safety monitoring right. uh, board, uh, um, and also uh, established uh, along with uh, uh, us. They also review the safety and efficacy data. So uh, uh, we um, um, continuously communicate this information uh, um, 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 with 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 uh, right. FDA, and that, that may shape also the advancement of. But this is applicable for all. Uh, of course, programs. but the, you know, I think the you know the take home message is that there's many checks and balances that exist, right, to assure that these trials are moving forward in an ethical way that um, yes. prioritizes you know the safety of the patients. And I mention these things because again, given where we're at as a disease community. Um, you know, many of our uh, patients may be just learning, all right, about the clinical trial uh, process for, for the first time. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully, when you hear about these checks and balances, the close coordination with the FDA, uh, the thought that goes in, the investigators, independent bodies being involved, that builds your confidence uh, yes. that, you, that you can um, want to participate in a clinical trial. Um, you'll probably hear me mention this uh, several times, right, uh, that uh, absent community engagement, meaning patients making the conscious decision to participate in clinical trials, we will not get treatments and cures for mitochondrial disease. So um, you know, our, our goal here is to share information with you that uh, hopefully encourages you and makes you feel confident that it's a safe process to, to, to participate in, in uh, clinical trials. Um, now, as you mentioned, Dio Togra, one of the one of the most important aspects of any clinical trial are the inclusion criteria. And you know, you you 
started with a confirmed genetic diagnosis, right, of mitochondrial disease. And um, this is really important, but I, I wondered if you could just briefly comment on why it's important to have that confirmed um, genetic diagnosis of mitochondrial disease as opposed to a clinical diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, and, and it is it's obvious here that we have a very heterogeneous, and this, was, oh, this has been always um, in your forums and, and symposiums and, and being discussed that uh, uh, patients having multiple uh, 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 symptoms and, uh, um, and, and due to uh, genetic mutation and the severity of the mutation. And also there is a, another component of heteroplasmy here within the cells having uh, a mutated- Everything complicated about multi, mitochondrial disease. Yeah, so, like <laughs> as, as, uh, so there are multiple factors that in, 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 in involved causing this uh, heterogeneity. So um, and sometimes it, uh, it uh, gets on your way to uh, um, evaluate your uh, um, outcome measures proper, properly. And if you are starting with a, a very heterogeneous uh, population, so you may not have the right, indica the right indication and the disease patient within the population, which may impact the overall results. So uh, 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 it is uh, um, difficult to ignore the heterogeneity component, but uh, our goal was with that um, uh, uh, genetic requirement um, at least to limit the, the participation to uh, 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 mutations which are known uh, to be associated with mitochondrial myopathies along with the myopathy symptom. That is right. also a critical component for us. It's in a way the, the commonality is the, the, the myopathy component. Right. And, and so probably important for, again, our, our audience to understand that, um, you know, the genetic diagnosis, critical, uh, must be in place. Um, and that just reinforces the importance of getting to a genetically confirmed uh, diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. That's another conversation for another time, but we're thinking a lot, right, about how to facilitate more diagnoses of mitochondrial disease so that more patients then are available and eligible to participate in these clinical trials. But secondly, it's also the myopathy component. And it doesn't mean that you only have muscle-based uh, symptoms, uh, but it needs to be a significant uh, right, component of your journey right, with, with mitochondrial disease. So sort of by definition, you expect that there will be many different patients with many different diagnoses, but the commonality are, are these myopathies. Yes. And, and yes. that's what will be used and, and judged as, a, as the primary endpoint is the ability to improve those symptoms. And the six minute walk test is of course, uh, you know, familiar to this community has been used in other uh, clinical trials, uh, but um, uh, fundamentally uh, Tolga, fair to say this is the, or the best validated instrument that we have for assessing how someone might be improving if they're taking an intervention is their capacity for being able to walk further in a defined yes. period of time. Yes, it has, it has been, uh, um, uh, even, even though it was not uh, validated for this particular uh, indication or clusters of, of the, the syndromes, uh, um, um, but however, has been uh, uh, successfully used in other neuromuscular disorders and uh, um, uh, currently uh, uh, considered as a, a primary endpoint uh, by also the regulatory bodies in, in, in our uh, studies. So we are uh, doing a quite work around that um, about the six minute walk test. Uh, the, the standardizing the test across the study sites, right. uh, having a close uh, uh, a training to the site. So uh, uh, with the goal of uh, implementing this test in a standardized way, right. as I mentioned, we have a number of uh, um, sites so then we can implement this in a standardized way. 
Right, very important. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, those of you that uh, have already submitted questions through the Q&A. Um, uh, capturing those over there, and I'm going to get to those in, in a second, and I want to encourage others um, to submit through the Q&A box if you have uh, questions you'd like me to pose to, to Dr. Ooze. Uh, so maybe just briefly to follow up on that primary endpoint being uh, the six minute walk test and judging a patient's ability to walk further uh, and, and show improvement um, while, while on the drug. But there are secondary endpoints or additional endpoints you're collecting. And you briefly mentioned this, but I, I want to just call this out because I, I think it it comes to patient centricity, which I know is very important to Astellas. You have a whole department uh, you know, named yeah. this and dedicated to it, but it's about you know, designing drugs, but also making sure that you're designing trials that are meaningful to the patients that you're trying to help. So some of these secondary endpoints, um, like fatigue and quality of life, um, um, those are well known, but maybe you could just briefly describe some of the video-based digital assessments yeah. that, that you plan to use, because that, that really is um, uh, interesting new development and uh, really gives the patient a chance to literally show right to you know, to to the sponsor uh, the difference of what this what being involved in the trial means to them yes no, I mean uh, yes uh, uh, as as you mentioned that um, um, we are uh, uh, part of uh, uh, um, our um, this uh, the focus area approach and this emerging uh, areas uh, of course one of the challenges are the not having mature or established uh, right. endpoints. Right. And uh, uh, that was also uh, um, part of the, the whole efforts that Astellas are, are, are taking to the, the, the patient centricity and to basically bring the input uh, uh, through uh, organizations like BMDF and uh, connecting to patients. Um, this is also part of uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the now common interest of regulatory bodies as well to what is important to patient and whether are we, are we measuring what is important to the patients and why the patients are coming to studies, what symptoms are bringing them to the clinical studies. So um, if we understand this more, uh, uh, that will help us to design better studies and better outcome measures. This is why um, um, your contribution or your communities and the, the patients, caregivers, families' contribution is uh, uh, um, extremely important, providing that feedback. So I remember that you have uh, some of your community members had your our synopsis reviewed when we were first uh, uh, working on the uh, study. Uh, uh, we got very useful feedback uh, uh, from there. Um, and that's how also this uh, video assessments came to the, the picture. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier at the FDA UMDF workshop, which uh, our team uh, found it extremely uh, useful and beneficial. And uh, you see a lot of uh, impacts of it on our current uh, study design and protocol, uh, um, having uh, um, your community members articulating that the the challenges uh, uh, um, providing uh, some uh, test outcomes uh, frequently through frequently visits and at the study sites. Right. Uh, so, um, of course, uh, the test like six minute walk test uh, uh, requires on site study site uh, uh, assessment. But um, we are developing in the meantime some uh, alternatives or supporting to this concept of how we can evaluate motor function with uh, 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 video uh, recordings, working our colleagues at uh, Casimir, which uh, they presented also in your forums before, right. uh, um, implementing some of those, their tools that they were using earlier in Duchenne muscular dystrophy studies, uh, that uh, um, how uh, uh, patients' uh, uh, activities, like going up the stairs or walking, going up to, from the sofa, uh, um, and, or compensatory movements and the quality of their movements, how it is being impacted and how that can be converted to a, a numerical outcome so we can statistically analyze the data uh, at the end of the study, compare our compounds right. to placebo. And, and also we have this um, interviews that uh, um, in our sim your symposium uh, we mentioned last year, 
uh, at the screening and, and during the, the exit to collect patients' uh, uh, feedback about the treatment, their experience about the study, and uh, the impact of the, the treatment on their um, quality of life. So uh, um, it is, uh, we are collecting that and we have also individual activity assessments, uh, basically um, how uh, their daily activity is impacted right. by their most bothersome symptom, because it might be different for each uh, a participant, even though uh, fatigue and muscle weakness are common, but there are also other symptoms individually due to specific mutation can be more uh, important to a certain patients. Right. Yeah. And, you know, of course, we've had a you know a number of efforts related to building out the patient voice. It started with the patient focused drug development meeting early in, in, in 2019. Uh, but this FDA workshop uh, later in 2019, you know, really important. And all of that is centered on understanding the burden of the disease, right, for our patients, uh, but also what what do idealized treatments look like? What's meaningful to yep. you? You know, if um, if you're able to uh, cook dinner for for your family and previously weren't, right? It, 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 you know, that's a, a meaningful outcome. That sort of feedback from directly from the patients is really helpful to the drug developers as they think about which endpoints and how to design their trials. Um, you know, to ensure the best match, right, of yeah. developing interventions yeah. that, that are meaningful. Uh, I'm going to turn to the questions here from the Q&A. Uh, there's a few that have been really about sort of the, the you know, the logistics of the, of, of, of the trial. Um, you know, one of the, I mean, most important questions to our community is, you know, will they need to uh, abandon their current standard of care, which for most of our patients is a, a supplement, a so-called mito cocktail. Um, what are the uh, criteria for um, um, how they might have to uh, change their current regimen? I mean, we, we know how uh, uh, important and, 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 and some of our uh, potential participants have been a long time on this uh, uh, um, um, vitamins and supplements under the uh, mitococktail umbrella. So we allow them, and uh, but we have a certain criteria about the duration, and also we encourage the, 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 the patients not to change the regimen right. and or yeah. work with the study investigators. So, yeah, so it's uh, quite for, the contrary. Yes. No one is being asked to give up the regimen. Yes. In fact, <laughs> they have to demonstrate that they've maintained their regimen. And I guess all of this is towards making sure that as patients come into the trial, they've established a baseline that isn't yes. moving because there's changes being made right around their mitococktail. So that is extremely uh, important. Right. And uh, that also participates from all. Um, when, when it's important that how when we analyze the data, so the stability of the patients and uh, if you have a certain exercise regimen, so keep the same regimen. If you have a certain use of um, uh, supplement regimen, keep the regimen. Because um, if we have this, all these variables are keep um, changing and adding. So it will really impact when we analyze uh, the data. So it may, um, so it, it may, um, uh, we cannot uh, um, uh, evaluate properly uh, right. the data. Any, any by, good study design, you don't want to have yeah. too many things changing right, at one time. Yeah. So, I mean, we highly encourage our participants to uh, discuss these topics um, and, and issues with the study investigators. We are working with, um, um, these are not commercial sites. These are very respected um, academic centers and, and academicians are study investigators and uh, well-known investigators in the field with years of experience with the mitochondrial disorders. So right. they uh, are, uh, um, are familiar with the uh, uh, current uh, 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 um, um, regimen of uh, the, uh, the treatments. Right. And uh, they will um, uh, guide you based on the requirements of the protocol. Uh, by the way, we develop this protocol with them with their feedback. Right. So uh, uh, this is why it should fit to the um, our participants' needs and their lifestyles because we continues to build that feedback into designing uh, the study. So, yeah, so that's I probably would, the, the, yeah. the most important you know, nugget there from, from what you said is that it, it's very much a conversation that needs to take place between the patient and their healthcare provider, right? About their 
mitochondrial disease, the symptoms they're faced with, you know, the diagnosis, um, but also that's the best place to assure that you're following the regimen that's necessary that could make you eligible uh, for, for a study like this. So uh, please do uh, you know, discuss it with your doctor. And if your doctor is not one of the uh, study participants, uh, we can always help facilitate that contact to one of the investigators from that. You know, on that front, there was a question asked, uh, when will the sites be announced? So maybe this is a good chance just to update everybody on, on the status of the planning. I know it's not quite launched and ready, but uh, what, what do you anticipate at this point, Tolga? So we, we, we have um, um, our initial engagements are uh, uh, done, uh, mm -hmm. but we need to wait until the, the activating the, the, the sites following uh, 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 state and local guidelines and the approval of each uh, 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 study run and, and in human. And uh, um, um, uh, we are um, expecting uh, 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 in within a few weeks, uh, some of the sites are being active in, 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 in the study. And uh, um, uh, as we form this information will be updated. But uh, um, um, I think uh, um, right now many uh, key investigators are aware about this study and uh, about the details. And um, as you said uh, earlier, Phil, uh, um, um, they might be uh, their um, uh, um, physician currently as well, some of our investigators. Right. Please uh, uh, um, uh, speak. Uh, and talk with your um, uh, on physician and, uh, uh, and they will definitely connect you to a potential investigators. Yes, and that, that certainly, we, we, we can help with that. And I just wanna take a, a moment to remind everyone, we do uh, try to use our website as a, a sort of a clearinghouse, if you will, well, one place to go and find out about all the clinical trial activity going on in mitochondrial disease. That's actually on the research page. So uh, umdf.org slash research. There's a big button at the top that says clinical trials. So that will take you down then to a section that has all the active or um, let's say active, not yet enrolling uh, you know, trials. So all of those that are either clinically active or very close to, to being launched. If you then click on any one of them, there's additional information about the target population, which give you an idea of eligibility. But most importantly, there's then a direct link from there to clinicaltrials.gov, because that is the one place uh, that's official. Right? The, the sponsor will update the information on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and uh, that way we're not constantly having to refresh it on our own page as changes are made. Uh, we encourage you to start there, move to clinicaltrials.gov for the latest information on the sites that are involved or, or any other changes associated with it. Uh, there was a question uh, asked by, by one of our participants today. Uh, so, you know, this is a tablet, right? So it's being taken orally. Um, but you know, many of our patients may have trouble with swallowing. That's one of the, you know, the symptoms that uh, many members of our disease community have. Uh, will it be possible to crush the drug or you know, do, uh, do, you know, make a change like that? Or will they have to swallow a tablet to, to be a part of the protocol? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, to, to take the, the whole uh, uh, tablets and it's comparable actually to the um, uh, the other um, uh, supplements or uh, mm -hmm. uh, vitamins right. Are, right. The, the patients are uh, taking. Um, 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 we do not uh, uh, have those uh, studies yet that uh, uh, that may impact the absorption of the compound, and so that's uh, that's um, um, we are uh, asking to 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 take the whole tablet. So, so at this point. They would yeah, have to take point. it, but it is, they wouldn't be able to mix it with, uh, you know, food or, or, you know, something else. Uh, at, at this point, it would be the requirement of being able to swallow the, the tablet as it is. And that, there are more detailed uh, um, information that will be communicated uh, with the, 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 the participants during that uh, uh, um, uh, first interaction uh, and, and all or, or going through the, the eligibility and requirements. Right. So um, um, more details will be um, communicated through the um, in study investigation. Yeah, just a, uh, yeah, another uh, reminder that it's the conversation between you with your healthcare provider, your physician, 
who then, you know, if they're not actively in the trial, can make sure that they know the, the latest information uh, to, to make a determination of whether you're a good candidate to, to participate in it. They'll so appreciate your uh, sharing that. Um, not surprisingly, um, I think our patient community would want to know, you know, in a, uh, a randomized placebo controlled trial, all right, there is the possibility that you're actually not on drug, right, that you're on, in the placebo arm. And this is really important for being able to separate out, you know, who responds and who doesn't. But um, talk a little bit about how you are sure that everyone has access to the drug in the trial eventually. Yes, uh, um, I mean, the, the, of course, it is, uh, uh, it's crucial. It's, it's a, a crucial component mm -hmm. of, our, uh, um, of, the, of the drug development that uh, um, it's all our studies are um, placebo control studies. So we can uh, um, uh, really understand uh, the, the pure drug effect and uh, um, versus open label uh, uh, studies that which um, the, the participants know they are on drug. And, uh, um, and um, um, however, um, we have an open label extension part, as I mentioned uh, um, during the presentation of uh, six months after uh, um, our, our treatment, uh, double blind uh, uh, randomized treatment that um, subjects, all participants will be offered to, uh, to participate uh, with the, our compound to open label extension uh, phase if they choose to do so. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a choice, uh, but all participants would have the opportunity, right, to um, go on to the drug for this 24 week period. Yes. And and I realize we're probably getting a little ahead of ourselves, but if the phase three data were starting to look positive and there was an indication of, uh, of efficacy, is it possible that open label extension period could be further extended beyond 24 weeks? Uh, that uh, um, all depends on uh, the, the study timelines and the data unblinding and, right. and evaluation, right. etc. Right. So it is difficult to, to commit and uh, or, or um, plan at, at, at this moment. Yeah. But it does uh, happen. There are cases yeah. where it happens, but you know, there are times where it may, may not be possible to. It may happen, but it's all about the, um, how the data will be collected, clean and analyzed, and etc. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's there's a question here about the uh, sit to stand uh, component. Um, yes, you know, I think it's one of the secondary right uh, endpoints being assessed there. So is, is that a requirement that they're able to do five of them, or you know, if they can only do a few, does that affect eligibility, or or it's a case of you, you the participants do as many as they can. So uh, um, the, the, the criteria, we, in the eligibility criteria, what we have is that uh, 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 patients, um, uh, participant uh, who, can, who is able to perform uh, those uh, uh, motor function tests, both and, and, and six minute walk test and, and sit to stand. So uh, for, um, we have to, um, uh, uh, and it, it, it is oftentimes uh, uh, by the uh, discretion of uh, our investigator, right. by their evaluation, by their judgment, by based on their communication with the, the participant. Uh, uh, so um, uh, this will be uh, uh, communicated and, and, and worked with the, uh, the participant. The, the reason <clears throat> we added the, the another motor function test, uh, again, to innovate towards, to, to um, mitigate or overcome a potential challenges with the, the six minute walk test. It's a highly variable test. And uh, despite the fact that it's being often frequently used, but uh, there's a big variability. Um, it has been also demonstrated that the, from the previous uh, uh, studies. And uh, this is why um, uh, I think the community felt the need that to add other uh, motor yes. function tests, as well as also uh, uh, this video assessment that I mentioned earlier. Right. Right. So all, that, all supportive uh, of finding yeah, efficacy. Yes, right? all together, uh, yeah. yes. 
Yeah, so uh, last call for uh, questions. We're going to be wrapping up here uh, soon, but if anybody um, still has a question, pop it into the Q&A. Um, um, but uh, there was a question uh, posed here, uh, Tolga, uh, would, would thyroid medication necessarily be some kind of contra uh, indication or a problem would have to be spaced apart from that? Or is that, again, a conversation that's going to be best served with yes. uh, their particular... So uh, we, we have a, 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 a list of compounds. I mean, that's also important in the clinical trials. Yes. What interact with your given compound right. and uh, based on how it eliminates from the, the body, uh, since it will impact the kinetics, there are certain compounds that uh, uh, we allow or we do not allow during the clinical trials. So, uh, um, and we are aware that uh, uh, this population has, uh, uh, based on the number of symptoms they are dealing with, unfortunately, a number of uh, uh, um, uh, medication. So uh, this will be evaluated by the guidance we are providing based on the features of our compound. Right. Uh, um, and investigators uh, uh, well aware of those details and uh, they will work with it, each individual participant how and there because in some classes of uh, 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 treatment maybe there is one drug it may have interact maybe others may right. not interact right. so right. the uh, uh, so many classes have alternative options that working with the study investigator uh, and the, their physician that can be judged and decided. So um, please just talk and, and work with uh, your uh, study investigator. Yep, again, physician, study investigator, decision can, can be made from there. So in, in, in wrapping up, I'd, I'd really like, I'd like to end with a, a kind of a call to action, if you will, for our, for our patient community. Uh, you know, it, it's Again, it's exciting. Clinical trials are here. They're getting started. Um, I know I have contact to a, a lot of different you know, companies that are even thinking about coming into the space. So I expect there'll be even more activity in, in the coming years. That's all exciting. But it's really about what we do now, right, to, to, to play our part in having a, a success. Ultimately, it comes down to the drug itself and its ability to be proven safe and, and, and effective. Um, you know, you know, Tolga, I, I know in, in chatting with you before this that you, you've, you've had the honor of being involved with drug development programs that have been successful, that have actually gotten a drug to market for other diseases, not in mitochondrial disease. And I'm wondering, you know, is there anything from your experience base that you know, would be helpful for our patient community? Well, what are the attributes? What are the activities of, of, of disease communities that are beneficial, right? That help kind of move the process of, of, along? I mean, the, the, the feedback is extremely important, at, at the, especially for the, uh, the, the rare disease indications. Uh, for the common diseases, you can find uh, a lot of public information and the sources that uh, it can help your uh, development program. Right. But in, uh, um, in the dis indications that natural history studies are not uh, well done and there is no public available information. So uh, this is why um, it's extremely important, these activities you are uh, uh, launching that uh, bringing uh, the, the, the patients and the community together with the industry members and, uh, uh, and the academicians and the, the clinicians. So um, there can be this information exchange right. to support. Uh, so then it, it, it can help us to better determine what we will measure in our studies based on what is important to patients. So I will highly encourage your community. Uh, uh, you are the great, you are providing this uh, platforms but uh, it will be great if they come and participate. Uh, uh, we will be extremely helpful. Yeah. For this. Well, I think that, that really, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about how to create a culture of clinical trials inside mitochondrial disease. And, and one of the most important thing that, that patients can do, peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication, just sharing with others that you know, you know may have potential benefit uh, from, from, from this trial. You know, 
tell your friends, your, your fellow uh, Mito patients about opportunities like that and spread the word. You know, know that UMDF will be here doing everything we can to spread the word. Um, of course, patient registries are always an important part as well uh, in recruiting for clinical trials. And we're really excited that our, our new patient registry is going to be uh, opening in the next uh, one to two weeks. We're just putting the final touches on and really encourage everyone to join, be a part of that and know that um, whatever we're gathering there, it's all with an eye towards developing treatments and cures to benefit the mitochondrial um, disease community. So these are a few of the things uh, that you can do you know, individually to be involved in clinical research and help us get to these um, much needed treatments and cures for mitochondrial disease. Uh, you know, Tolga, I uh, can't thank you enough for, for making the time today. I'm glad we were able to uh, provide this platform to share information. It's very much a story still in development. It's the, you know, yes. we're, we're almost there and, and it sounds like uh, some additional details will be coming in the weeks ahead. Uh, just one last time um, uh, for our audience, you know, always you know, feel free, come to the UMDF website to the research page where the clinical trials are listed. You can click through then to clinicaltrials.gov. We also provided that direct link in the, in the chat box. Uh, this is where the most up-to-date information will be. But as soon as we're aware that uh, sites are actively recruiting, I'm sure there's going to be some messages going out uh, through our normal channels. Uh, so, so again, uh, Toga, thank you again for your time today. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap this up and we look forward to joining you again soon with more uh, yes. uh, uh, exciting details about not just this trial, but other uh, drugs that are in development as well. Have a good day, thank everybody. You. Thank you, Phil, for the opportunity. Thank you.